Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Edwin Rydell, and I've been in charge of business development at Progeny Drone since March of this year. I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and I see that we have attendees from many time zones around the globe, so thanks for coming. I've worked on the business side of plant and crop measurement technologies for over a decade. In today's session, Anthony will build on last month's webinar that focused on the basics of UAV data collection with drones and small plot field trials and how that is now possible to do quickly with basic hardware and a laptop. Today, he will discuss how data sets can be combined over time to provide a dynamic picture of crop emergence development and also many stresses which are impacting performance. And with that, I pass the virtual microphone to Progeny's co-founder, Dr. Anthony Hurst. Thanks, Edwin. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Again, my name is Anthony. I'm co-founder and CEO of Progeny Drone, Inc. And we provide software that helps agronomists use low-cost, off-the-shelf drones and inexpensive hardware to collect measurements for outdoor small plot research trials. So we're a very specialized company focused on this one application and we have support from the Purdue Foundry. And uh, Dr. Katie Rainey unfortunately couldn't make it today, uh, but she's our other uh, co-founder and um, will be presenting uh, some work from one of her studies. And then um, please let us know if you'd like to get in touch with her. So thanks to those of you who attended our previous webinar on stand counts. Today we'll be talking about generating and analyzing image time series. And we actually are going to be offering uh, a bunch of webinars over the next couple of weeks on different topics, including data management and tricks for dealing with hard to stitch, hard to grid data, and also focusing on various types of cameras that many agronomists are using today and at the end of this season, we are going to do a webinar focused on plant height measurements. So we hope to see you at these upcoming events and let us know if there's something in particular you're looking for. So first, for those of you who are new to our group, I'm going to explain the target audience for these webinars. And then I'll explain what time series are and why they're important. And then we'll provide a series of tips that will help you collect good quality and usable time series data. And we'll show you a detailed example with 15 flights over a soybean trial with just a off the shelf drone and camera. And we'll conclude with Q and A. So uh, we would, we'll ha we're happy to stick around uh, and answer all of your questions. So first, the target audience for these webinars is really agronomists who don't have any programming or image analysis expertise. You might be someone who's, but you're doing a lot of outdoor small plot research trials. And maybe you got a drone, maybe you've been trying to use drones for a couple of years now, uh, and you're here looking to get more out of the drone that you already have, or you're just getting started and wanting to learn how to do this. So this is for you. And for others who already have a lot of experience with this, some of this might be a bit of review. Uh, so bear with us and thanks. So first, what is a time series? So you might have heard of time series before, but we're not talking about just collecting data, you know, once a year or once a month. Um, we're talking about doing flyovers, you know, every few days during important growth and development stages of your crop to try to capture these dynamic traits. So uh, why do we need these time series? It's because some of these traits are really inherently defined by a rate of change over time. For example, we can measure the growth rate of crops, uh, which is telling us about their vigor. And also biomass accumulation is something that is really useful when you have multiple measurements over time. And also, the timing of some traits is really important and highly variable. So you can't really measure it with just one sampling date. Like for example, flowering or maturity. 
or looking at stress indicators, like if, if plots exhibit stunted growth or yellowing. We want to try to answer questions like, when did this stress happen and how severe was it or how long did it take for the plot to recover? And so drone image time series in particular allow us to quantify these traits more precisely and with less effort. So this is a really great opportunity. So to give you a quick example of how this can work, uh, my, our co-founder, Dr. Katie Rainey, recently did a study uh, looking at impacts of glyphosate on different varieties of soybean. And basically we were able to collect time series for canopy coverage and greenness just using an uh, off-the-shelf camera and drone. And we can see in these graphs that after applying the treatment, uh, the susceptible varieties showed uh, decreases in greenness and canopy cover. And also the rate of recovery from the treatment depended on the dosage Whereas for the resistant varieties, we don't really see very significant effects on canopy coverage and greenness. So this shows you how time series can not only help you distinguish varieties, but give you really detailed information on their responses to things like stress. So how do we generate a useful image time series? Uh, we're gonna give you a whole range of important tips to keep in mind. So first, you really want to try to fly at a constant altitude over time and with the camera at nadir or downward perspective. This ensures that you're gonna get pretty constant image resolution over time. And that's going to make it easier for you to overlay your images from different dates and also get you consistent measurement precision over time, which will help keep your analysis a little bit more simple. Now, uh, there's something about image resolution that I'd like to clarify. I think it's been a source of confusion for a lot of people. First of all, the image resolution in a raw image from your flight is not constant. For example, here we've got these two white targets uh, in the white boxes here. And we can pretty clearly see that the target on the bottom of the image, it shows up larger than the target on the top left of the image, um, even though the white squares are actually the same size on the ground. And that's because the resolution in the bottom part of the image is actually higher than in the top part of the image. That's because the bottom part of the image is, uh, the ground was closer to the camera. So again, keep this in mind, resolution is not constant in your raw images. So this is why we generate ortho imagery. And in ortho imagery, the resolution is constant. So now you can see that the target on the bottom right and top left, now the white squares are about the same size in the image, uh, around three centimeters per pixel in this case. So the key points here are that raw image resolution varies within and across images, but software can let you, will let you choose a constant resolution to generate your ortho imagery at. However, this does not change the underlying image resolution of your data. It's only changing the resolution that it's displayed at. So we're not uh, magically increasing our image resolution. So please don't be fooled by that. So next up uh, is it's really important to collect high overlap, uh, at least 80% forward and side overlap in agricultural terrain so you get accurate, accurate stitching. And if you do this, then you won't need any ground control points. And all you really need is high relative positional accuracy. So this makes it really easy to reuse a single plot grid on multiple flight dates. You just shift it around a little bit from one date to the next. And also, you really need high measurement precision when you're collecting a time series. Uh, because we're trying to detect pretty small changes over time from one flight to the next. And we can do this using multiple replicate plot images from each flight date that are coming from your overlapping images. So I'll explain that a bit more. So uh, many research groups are now implementing this new approach to generating ortho imagery for small plot trials. 
basically, um, instead of generating one single giant ortho image of the whole field and then trying to analyze the plots in that ortho mosaic, we uh, realized that instead we can just generate ortho images of individual plots uh, coming from different uh, individual raw images. So we end up with multiple ortho images of each plot and we call these plot clips. And this allows us to avoid the mosaicing errors or color distortion that you'll often see in ortho mosaics and preserve the raw image sharpness and colors and quantify the precision and improve the accuracy of our measurements. For example, uh, if we have you know, five images of a plot, we can repeat our measurement five times and also get a standard deviation for the measurement. And you can't do that if you just have one giant ortho mosaic. So this is a great uh, approach if you have software that allows you to do this. Also, I highly recommend just flying as frequently as possible when you're trying to capture your trait variation, maybe around twice a week, around the time that you would normally observe this trait. And also try to start your flights a little bit early, like before you would normally visit the field and end them a little bit late. Um, and the reason for that is just that you might capture more variation than you expect. Um, with this high resolution imagery. So it's important to not miss that opportunity. And also try to capture at least one centimeter per pixel, pixel spatial resolution so you get good precision on your measurements. Usually you can get that by flying anywhere from 20 to 40 meter altitude. Also, it's important that we're labeling the plots consistently over time. And one uh, advice that we gave in the previous seminar I'm going to try to keep reminding you about is that you really should just leave a little flag marking the corners of each trial or block of plots that you want measurements for. Uh, this is because if your corner plots are labeled correctly and your stitching is accurate, then most likely the remaining plots in your trial are going to be labeled correctly. So it's really those getting those corners right that's critical. Also, you want to ensure that your plot images are precisely centered on the correct rows of vegetation. Uh, the reason is that this allows us to use um, measurement buffers. So you can see in the diagrams on the bottom right, uh, the, green, the one that's outlined in green is a good example where you have the plot centered within the image and we can set some horizontal and vertical buffering away from the edge of the image. So our measurements are only done inside of that measurement zone. And that's going to help minimize the impacts of weeds or edge effects on our measurements, depending on how we set the buffers. And uh, also looking at the example on the far right, that's showing you what happens if the plot isn't centered properly. Then basically, if you try to set measurement buffers away from the edges of your images, you're, end up, you're gonna end up cutting out part of your plot and possibly even just <laughs> biasing your measurement even more. So uh, really software that you're using to do this kind of analysis should offer this type of a feature for you and make this easier. One problem that not a lot of people realize until they try this is that actually plots can shift and change shape as they grow and also blow over or lodge. And so this can make it tricky to keep your plot images centered precisely on the correct rows. And this is why it's really uh, good if your software can help you by trying to auto automatically center your plot images for you, as long as you give it a good enough starting point. Because uh, this will eliminate the need to keep redrawing your grid on every flight date. That's a fair amount of work. Another important tip is that you really please try to just start with and stick with one camera for your time series. Avoid switching cameras in the middle of your time series uh, unless it's absolutely necessary just to keep things consistent and also use fixed settings on your camera if at all possible 
in the previous webinar, we recommended that you, for example, set your ISO sensitivity to the lowest possible value or 100, and also your shutter speed at something like one over two thousandths of a second, so you can minimize motion blur. If you have any more questions about camera settings, please ask us about this during the Q&A session. We have more info on this. So I want to acknowledge that, yes, it is challenging to do this type of work. Um, first of all, obviously, logistics are, can be a problem, getting all these flights done. And sometimes the weather won't cooperate with you. And also, uh, the processing time for all these data has been a barrier for a lot of people. And data management can also be tricky. Actually, our upcoming webinar will be focused on data management. So we hope to see you there. Um, but uh, I want to just make clear that software can make this a lot easier for you. So for example, we'll show you uh, getting soybean canopy cover, row length, and green leaf index from 15 flights over a soybean trial using software that we developed and offer called Plot Phoenix. And I'll just walk you through this example here. So we've got 15 flights. Uh, each is in a little folder, so you have um, one folder for, for each flight date. And what you do is you can start out by just picking one date and treating that like your reference date. And then you just select that input folder and provide a name for your location and experiment. You can just type that into a form. And then you can just check boxes for doing the stitching and gridding on this flight date. And in a few minutes, you can get your stitched orthomosaic of the field. So this diagram is just showing where the camera was for every photo that was taken and a point cloud model of the terrain. And then in the grid step, uh, software can just display your mosaic on the screen. You can rotate it around and in this stage, we want to define our plot grid for the trial. And you can do this basically by first pinning down where the corners of your trial are. Again, it really helps if you just leave a little flag uh, near the corner plots so you can easily recognize where you need to pin down your corners. So you can just zoom in on that spot. And you know, again, it would help if we saw a little flag there. In this case, we don't have them. Um, it's really a good idea to do that. So after you pin down all four corners, the grid can adjust accordingly. In this case, we've got about 300 plots here. And again, you, uh, it's great if you have an auto centering feature in your software. It makes it easier for you to get these images centered right. And also if you can use measurement buffers to help avoid weeds. You can see there's a lot of weeds in this field. So after you define your grid on that one date, uh, you want to make sure that it's really, really precisely centered and accurate because we're going to actually be reusing this grid on other flight dates. So we want it to be like a good uh, reference grid. So after you define that grid, then you can use that grid on other flight dates just by taking a, a plot layout file, we call it, and just copy pasting it into the folders for the other flight dates. Uh, there's also this file that records the image resolution for the ortho imagery, and we're going to copy that file over as well. And that's going to allow us to enforce the same image resolution over time in our ortho images, even if the flights weren't all at the same exact altitude. So now that we've copied over the grid info, we can just select the other folders for the other flight dates and then automatically stitch them in batch. And um, again, we've got 14 of them here, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, but basically, we are able to stitch the remaining 14 flight dates in about an hour or so. Um, that's around 1,700 images there. And this is being done on just a laptop computer. So you really don't need um, like a supercomputer or anything expensive. So after you stitch the imagery from all the flight dates, then we need to overlay the grid 
on all the flight dates. And again, you don't need any ground control points for this. You can just take that grid from that reference date and it will automatically be overlaid on the other flight dates. And really you just need to slightly adjust where the corners of the grid are on each date. And then the rest of the grid will slide into place. And this is going to work really well, especially if you have accurate stitching. So you really wanna collect high image overlap. It'll make your life easier. You won't have to do as much of these manual adjustments uh, for plot centering. So again, um, we repeat this process for all 14 flight dates here. I'm gonna skip ahead so uh, we don't have to wait so long, um, but hopefully the idea is clear. Uh, and actually it only takes about an hour or so to do all 15 flight dates this way. So it takes less time to do it this way than to actually set up ground control points in the first place. Um, so after you've overlaid your grid on all the dates, then you can run what we call the images step where software will just extract ortho images of every plot directly from your raw frame photos. And that takes a while um, for this data set, a few hours. Um, and once you have the plot clips, the last step is to run the metrics step where we analyze the plot clips to get phenotypes. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm going to select just the first 10 flight dates, which are kind of like our early season dates. And I'm gonna use just a little bit of buffering, half, half a foot of buffering from the um, top and bottom and left and right of each plot because it's kind of early season here. We, so it makes sense to use that type of buffer. And uh, that takes about half an hour to run through all 15, or I guess the first 10 flight dates. And then for the last few flight dates, I'm setting uh, larger measurement buffers. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. Um, I'm also changing my strategy for how I'm sampling canopy pixels. Um, and then once I change those settings, I run the same analysis on the last five flight dates, and then we're done. So in this example, we actually processed 15 flight dates going from raw images to plot clips and measurements in about seven and a half hours. So that's around 30 minutes per, per flight date, uh, which is pretty typical. Um, and let's see here. So now we're gonna just look over some of the results um, and ways you can visualize the data. So here's an example of what outputs look like from uh, one flight date. Um, we're gonna actually just take the outputs and put them all in the same folder so it's kind of easy to access. You just copy paste the output folders over. And you can see that because uh, hopefully your software will label your outputs with a good file naming convention. So it's easy to keep track of everything. In this case, all the outputs have the flight date, camera, location, experiment name tagged to them. And here uh, we can visualize the ortho mosaics on Google Earth and we can look at how well our grid overlays over time. You can see that we're maintaining really good grid overlay from one date to the next. And this is all done without any ground control points and only with about an hour or so of actual work on the computer for pinning down your corners. So we get good grid, grid alignment. We also get multiple images of each plot from each flight date. And you, get, you can have measurement diagrams that show you like for example, canopy cover results. So the white pixels are vegetated pixels or we can visualize the greenness index or row length measurements. So looking at these can kind of quickly allow you to evaluate that the measurements are being done properly and are accurate. You can also visualize heat maps for your metrics at the plot level. So in these types of diagrams, you might start to see some treatment effects. Um, again, maybe not with just one sampling date, but in particular, if you look at changes over time, you can see more. Uh, it'll also, it should record where you pin down your corners on each date. So you make sure that you're doing that consistently. 
from one date to the next. There, you can also visualize the measurements at the field scale. Maybe you'll see some spatial patterns here. And of course, the, there can be an output that's just an Excel spreadsheet format. Uh, and it will list all of the measurements that come from your plot clips. And you can get summary statistics for each plot. Like for example, you know, average and standard deviation for each metric for each plot. And we're getting pretty small standard deviations from these measurements. That's well under half an inch for row length for our standard deviation there. So that's pretty good. And uh, in this case, it took about 20 minutes to process that particular flight date. On average, it was about 30 minutes per date. And also you can take the data from all the flight dates and combine it into a single Excel spreadsheet very easily. You just take one of the spreadsheets and just copy paste it into a folder and then take the data from the other spreadsheets and just do a, a copy paste. And, and all the spreadsheets are going to have the same you know, columns and be labeled consistently. So it's very easy to combine them into one sort of master spreadsheet. And that's maybe something that you could share with your whole research team. If you're doing multiple projects together, you want to keep everything consistently labeled but also easily accessible. So you could even just take this Excel spreadsheet that has all the data and upload it to a Google Drive folder and share it with your colleagues or something like that. So here it's just showing me doing that copy and um, combining the data. So in this example, we actually got 45,500 plot clips and three measurements per clip. And that was all done in seven and a half hours. Uh, it ends up being around five uh, measurements per second that we're generating here. And also, if you want to start visualizing the time series, of course, you need to uh, convert your time measurement into days, or maybe you would do days after planting, or even better, you would calculate growing degree days. Uh, in this case, I, don't ha I didn't have access to the planting date or the weather information for this trial, so I'm just treating the first flight date as day one. But you, um, again, it'd be great if you could use growing degree days or days after planting. Uh, and then after you've kind of combined all the data, you can sort it by row and range number and start plotting a time series for your plot. So here, we're just going to look at canopy cover over time for this first plot and see what we get. So I'm just selecting the measurements that came from the plot clips for that plot uh, row to range two. And I'm selecting the corresponding flight dates over here. And then we get this really beautiful um, sort of S-shaped growth curve over time. And you basically get this type of data for every plot. Um, and it's, I think it's exciting to work with this type of stuff. So you can see that the workflow doesn't have to be that hard. Um, so now we're going to take a more in-depth look at some of these plots. And in this case, uh, on the left, I'm showing high-resolution imagery of the experiment. And I've highlighted five plots in different colors that we're going to look at the time series for. And on the right is just showing the ortho mosaic from each flight date and showing the altitude and the number of images that were collected. And I'm just going to flip through this time series um, so you can see the change over time. Um, also note that Again, we've fixed our ortho image resolution to a constant value over time. So about 0.7 centimeters a pixel or around a quarter of an inch per pixel. And we're holding that constant, even though the altitude is going to change a little bit from one flight date to the next. Uh, this is just to make analysis and visualization easy. So moving forward. And also something to note is that for some reason, the pilot decided that they wanted to fly higher, like halfway through the time series. So they changed the flying height. Uh, we can still hold the ortho image resolution constant, but the underlying image resolution is not as good for these last few dates. Uh, so that's something you want to watch out for. Try to keep it a constant flying height if you can. 
And we can see some of these plots here are clearly starting to approach um, senescence or maturity. So now let's take a look at the data for those five plots I highlighted, and we'll look at canopy cover, row length, and the green leaf index over time. So first, in the early season, we track canopy cover, and we're using measurement buffers of half a foot in the vertical and horizontal here. And our strategy is gonna to be to only count canopy pixels that are within the measurement zone because this is going to help reduce the impact of weeds on our measurements. The downside is it's gonna limit our dynamic range for this measurement uh, for going up to 50% coverage, but that's actually okay. We're capturing most of the variation here. As you can see in the next graph. So looking at canopy cover over time and those dash lines represent the multiple replicate measurements we get from the plot clips on each flight date for each plot. And we can clearly see some separation here between the red and blue plots versus the purple, gold, and green plots. And also clearly something is going wrong with that green plot. Um, so this shows you how uh, the time series can really allow you to see differences between these plots over time that you might not capture with just one or two sampling dates. Like for example, if, if you only flew on 15 days after planting, yeah, you might see the separation that I just described, but you wouldn't know like when it started in the season or you wouldn't know that it actually got more pronounced later on, or maybe the, tre the trend could change in a few weeks. So that's why a time series is very useful. Also, I'd like to put forth a, an idea that I have for analyzing canopy cover time series that I, I sort of dabbled in during my dissertation, but I really wish I had more time to try this out, but uh, I'd rather provide the tools for you guys to do this. Um, so um, in this example, like according to this research paper, we've known for a long time that um, for healthy soybean and I think for various other crops too, the first half of canopy expansion can be uh, described with an exponential growth equation. Uh, here we can see uh, CC is the canopy cover, T is the time or growing degree days, and CGC is the canopy growth coefficient. And again, there's that S-shaped curve on the left. Um, and in particular, uh, if we we note that if we just take the logarithm of this equation, it becomes linear. Uh, so you can see in the graph on the left, we get this really nice linear trend in that first part of canopy expansion. And my idea, and I'm sure other of you have thought of this already too, maybe some of you have tried it already and I'd love to hear your uh, experience. Um, but basically, if this is an, a linear equation, then we ought to be able to just scan these time series and try to look for decreases in slope that are happening at certain dates during the season. And if we can detect a decrease in the slope of this curve, then that's uh, an indicator of stunted growth or stress of some kind. Uh, and we should be able to pinpoint the onset of that stress to within a few days of the flight. And that's, I think, pretty powerful. It helps you diagnose maybe what caused the stress. Like, uh, maybe you noted that there wasn't a lot of rainfall for a couple of weeks before that flight date, and that might be the cause. So again, um, another example of what it might be possible with a time series from drones. And now let's look at row length. So in this example, uh, we're looking again at the early season and using the same measurement buffers that we did for canopy cover, and we're restricting the row length measurements to the measurement zone. And again, this is just to help avoid the impact of weeds. Uh, we are limiting our measurement range to uh, up to one and a half feet, but that's okay. The plots don't get much longer than that anyway in this example. And uh, from what I can tell, uh, row length hasn't been studied as much as maybe some of these other traits, um, but I, I think that it could be related to emergence for some crops, and it might be useful for crops where it's really hard to measure things like stand counts 
uh, maybe row length could be a good alternative. And it's something that's really easy to measure with drones very precisely. So I think this is something worth looking into. Uh, for example, it, it might uh, show us different um, patterns in the data or help us see um, other relationships between plots. Like for example, um, if you recall from the canopy cover time series, we basically had the blue and red plots clustered together up at the top. And then the purple, gold, and green plots were all kind of clustered together at the bottom. But now when we look at row length, we see more separation between the purple, gold, and green plots. So that might tell us new information about the plots that we couldn't get with canopy cover alone. So again, this might be something to look into. And finally, let's look at green leaf index. Uh, we measure this metric, uh, this trait over the entire time series, and we're actually going to use a different strategy for the early and late season here. So first of all, um, it's really easy to measure canopy cover in the early season. And what that allows us to do is just use very minimal measurement buffers and then we can to avoid weeds. And we can just sample all the canopy pixels that are inside our measurement zone because we can be pretty confident that they are actually canopy pixels. So that's why we use this sampling strategy in the early season. However, in the late season, it becomes really a lot harder to measure canopy cover because the vegetation might not be green anymore. It, it might even be the same color as the background soil at that point. So it's kind of hard to um, segment the imagery. And it's also much harder to center the plots accurately because you can't really see where the gaps between the rows are anymore. And so what we do to deal with this situation is we can increase our measurement buffers in the vertical and horizontal. So we've got a more narrow measurement zone and our sampling strategy is also different. We can sample all of the pixels that are in the measurement zone and we can be pretty confident that they're gonna be um, pixels from the correct row of vegetation, even if the images are not perfectly centered. So you can be pretty strategic about this. And here is the resulting graph of green leaf index over time for these five plots. And we're seeing similar clustering, the, again, the red and blue plots on the top, and then the purple, gold, and green on the bottom, in particular in the early season. But then some, some, some interesting things happen as we get to the later season. First of all, that green plot, even though it had really low canopy cover throughout, um, for whatever reason, it actually um, jumps up in greenness um, and joins up with the red and blue plots. And also uh, the blue plot starts showing a decline in greenness near the end of the season, whereas all the other plots are still appear to be going up in greenness. Uh, so that's really interesting. And uh, if we look at the imagery uh, for those plots, we can start to get an idea of why that might be happening. Basically, it, it seems like this blue plot might be maybe an early maturity variety of soybean, uh, whereas the others may be mature at a later date. So this shows you another uh, trait or piece of information that you can start to quantify with time series from drones um, in a very straightforward way. So in conclusion, you know, time series might have been too laborious to collect in the past, especially on this scale, but not anymore. And they show us really important changes within plots and differences between plots that just a static measurement can't show us. And this is why I think that we really need more research on collecting time series. And maybe we're, we're, we might be missing some really valuable data by not collecting time series. So with that, we'd like to open up the floor for questions.